welcome back to video number two. So I rewatched. I've had a really hard time uh, like listening to any podcasts that I've been on and like or watching any videos that I've made. And the problem with that is that it makes it kind of hard to improve because I don't have that realistic uh, perception of what I did right and what I did wrong. So I actually made myself listen to yesterday's video uh, or watch yesterday's video. And, and of course, like I went into total self-criticism mode about everything that was not perfect. Uh, so yeah, I know all those. I think I know all those things. And instead of getting completely overwhelmed and trying to make everything perfect this time, I thought I would just try and improve a few little bits and pieces. So a little bit to let you know a little bit about what I'm trying to do with these. I, I really like watching YouTubers and there's a lot of YouTubers who I actually just like to kind of hang out with, right? So it's not that their content is, you know, always that exciting, always that mind blowing, but I actually just like the people. I like hanging out with the people. And sometimes when, um, when a lot is going on in life and maybe if you're a bit of a, an introvert and you like that s sort of sense of socializing without having to put any effort in, it's nice to have that. It's, they call it, uh, in the literature, they call it a familiar social world, right? So you can get it from like, re-watching a TV series or hanging out with YouTubers that you don't actually know. But it's a really nice thing. It's a really nice relationship and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I'd kind of like to be one of those people that other people like to virtually hang out with uh, and hopefully pick up, that you hopefully pick up some tips and useful insights along the way. So I think I've got a long way to go to like get there, right? Because the people that I like to watch are, uh, are comfortable in themselves and themselves and, and clear and, and, and all of those things, right? So I am working toward that. And I actually, I had a bit of a rough week um, uh, last week. I got some, some bad news at the beginning of last week. And I, and the, the the prior week I had handed in my uh, new book manuscript. So I'd done this big sort of year long project of writing my new book and it was done. And then I got some really bad news. And so I was looking for something to refocus my attention on. And for a long time, I've kind of had this complex about, like I know I'm a good writer, uh, but I have had this insecurity about the fact that I'm maybe not the best speaker. Um, or I'm maybe not the greatest in on video or any anything where I need to talk, podcasts and whatever. And I don't know, I just got thinking about the fact that I, and I've thought about it before, I've thought about it a lot of times before, where I know, like, I wasn't a good writer when I started writing. Like, that's a skill that came after lots of practice. And there is absolutely no... Uh, reason to think that this would be any different. Uh, like I'm, I pretty much know that if I made 50 videos or 100 videos that I would be good at making videos by the end of it. And I really wanted to model what that process is like. That um, a lot of people I think had this idea that that it's a perception thing, like that you, ha that when you s approach something that you're anxious about, that you learn straight away that none of your fears were reality, right? That it was all just in your mind and really you graded it and you graded it straight away. And I don't think that that's, that was, it can work like that, sure, but in a lot of cases it doesn't work like that. You have to endure, endure that messy point of things, which is what I'm doing now. It's like where I'm starting at not being good at something and I'm going through all of the emotions and thoughts that that brings up, but hopefully going to stick at it um, for a while. And like it, that has really helped me deal with um, what I'm going through personally. I'll, I'll, I'm a, at some point I will tell that story, but I'm uh, but not right at the moment. It's not like anything life threatening or anything, uh, you know, too horrendous. But anyway, um, so yeah, that's what I'm I'm trying to do. I'm trying to refocus on something uh, as a way of kind of working through that pain. Um, but also, like, people sometimes really fear times of sadness in their life or times of loss or grief or whatever. They fear that, that they're going to completely fall apart during those times. And 
I've had this hang up for years about the fact that I'm not very good on video and I you know a couple of years ago I started making some videos and it didn't really go anywhere uh, but it felt like this time is a good this, things have kind of come together in my life where it's something that I can focus on for a, for a little while because this other um, phase of my new book project has ended and it, like really sometimes that life is like that that you can have something that um, has been a hang up for a long time and just the something has to fall into place for you to address it and for you to be able to put that a cognitive and emotional effort into addressing your anxiety about something and that's kind of what's happened here and the, the point that I wanted to make is that it's happened because I went through and am going through this sort of personally very sad loss and griefy time and so you really don't need to be scared of those times in your life because they can actually be the times that are the catalyst for something else that's transformative and you can you can use those times in a in a positive way so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here and it didn't really start out that way like I probably only realized actually after yesterday's video even that that was what I was that that was what I was doing um that uh that I was using this as using this challenge as a way to work through some of my grief and loss and yada yada yada. That's what I'm doing. I am going to take a few a couple of harder questions today. I'm going to do fewer questions and um, ones that are a wee bit harder. So again, just saying what I said yesterday. I'm these days I'm a writer. I'm not a clinical psychologist anymore. Um, and these are answers are just for information and purposes only and you should always go and see your own um, your own mental health professional or health professional or whatever if you've if you've got um, uh, major concerns and major things going on these are these are kind of hot takes on these questions so this is um, if I was seeing someone as a therapist this would not be how I would be doing this um, I would be getting a lot more information from the person before diving into advice or answers about these kinds of things so there's a good chance that that you know what I'm answering the sort of educated guesses that I'm making off the top of my head could be like completely down the wrong track for the for the person uh, and and in, in a normal in a normal circumstance where I was seeing someone one-on-one -on -one, I wouldn't be doing that right but there's a good chance that at least some of these answers will be useful uh, to people and be on track because they are educated guesses. But uh, you just if, if your question comes up, for example, and it's not the right answer for you, just you know bear in mind that like I might have given a different answer on a just different day. These are the things that are coming off literally off the top of my head. I'm trying not to think too much about the questions before I get on camera, so I can give you like a fresh, a fresh answer, uh, and. Yeah, and, and, and if, if it doesn't answer the question fully, then you know, maybe it is worth having even a, a session or two sessions with, um, with a psychologist or another mental health professional to address the question. Like if you've sent in a question, you've done half of the work, right? Because you've formed the question, you've formed the question in a really clear way to be able to send it in. So then you can go and say to somebody, look, this is the, I want to spend some time on this question just on this question and uh, maybe you have one session where you you get some advice and then you make a plan and you go away and try some things and then you come back and talk to, to the person about how it went and make some tweaks to that like that is one way that you could do it anyway let's get into today's questions and like I said some of these are a little bit harder and trickier and longer than than the last one I did so let's do a few all right so this is from Yvonne, and I'm, I'm going to try and read the question a, um, a little bit more slowly than I was reading the questions last time. Uh, and this is quite long, so let's, let's uh, take it from the top. I, hello, I've noticed that what makes me feel the most stressed out when I have a lot on are items that aren't necessarily long or time consuming or super urgent, but they're emotionally charged and usually sit across work and personal spheres around people related to work and that I care about but who are not my official responsibility. So for example, a colleague retired unexpectedly at a super busy time and I haven't organised a voucher or card yet. 
Uh, so I guess the voucher is like a gift card or some, some sort of like going away uh, present. That's what I took from the voucher. Uh, another example, a student I know is going through a hard time and is waiting for me to organize a video call with him. I've already provided support and I know he has folks around him so it's not urgent. A student who failed a piece of work last year is waiting for me to add something to the feedback I already gave him. A friend I care about wrote to me with a question that will help her with her work relating to our professional spheres. So these are the examples that, she, that Yvonne gave. She says, I have huge blind, blind irrational blocks around these that sit heaviest on my to-do list and in my tummy. It's the sort of anxiety that feels as though it burns and runs deeper. I've started identifying these tasks as such on my to-do list to address them. She labels them as not urgent but emotionally charged. I know it's to do with guilt, what is in, but I don't quite understand the mechanism yet. I'm quite happy with providing lots of personal support to my team and my current students, even if I tend to be quite private at work. Some avoidance style, she says in parentheses. This is getting very long and the question isn't clear. Sorry, I guess it is, because I think the question is pretty clear. Um, do you have any insights into why managing work-related stress becomes harder when it when a task spills over into the personal sphere? All right, so so Ivana said that she has somewhat of an avoidant style. So it sounds as if these are all scenarios, or most of them are scenarios that involve dealing with strong emotions, particularly on the part of the other person. So. Um, so where the student has failed something or the student's going through a hard time or another, another student is going through a hard time and so communicating with those people involves sort of encountering those uh, the other person's strong emotions and the other scenario is like that the person who retired at a super busy time like maybe she has some uh, maybe dealing with that scenario brings up some some thoughts or feelings maybe there's some resentment about um, being left in the lurch during the busy time or there's maybe there's some other reason why that scenario deal uh, brings up something emotionally charged um, it could be some it could be something completely different uh, but but there was something there that makes that emotionally charged and a friend I care about wrote to me with a question that will help her with her work Okay, so there's something again there that makes that emotionally charged. Like maybe it's, um, uh, maybe it's wanting to give like a lot of help or wanting to completely fix the person's problem for them or um, spoon feed them and not feeling like she has the resources or the time and energy to do that or whatever. It could be anything, right? But there's something that's making these emotionally charged, as as she said. So. One thing I would say is if dealing with strong emotions is something that either strong emotions belonging to you or strong emotions belonging to others, it's something that's difficult for you, then there's a lot of stuff out there that, that's good for having you think more and explicitly deal with strong emotions more so Brene Brown's work is an example right she talks a lot about shame and those sort of really deep emotions so if you're someone that tends to avoid deep emotions then that would be looking at some of that kind of work would potentially be quite helpful because it, it may help reduce some of your avoidance around those emotions uh, will help you understand a little bit better what your relationship to those kinds of emotions uh, is Another thing that might be quite useful that also really gets gets deep into emotions is my um, friend and colleague Guy Winch started a podcast recently. It's called Dear Therapists, and it's um, he's doing it with a with another colleague who I don't know called Laura Gottlieb. And it's their podcast is executive produced by Katie Couric, so it's kind of like a big deal. Um, but what they're doing is that they are taking a question from a reader each week and going in depth through uh, almost like a therapy session and with both of them weighing in, right? And the topics that they're, um, that they're tackling are mostly like interpersonal things. Like, so a lot of them about, are about family relationships and family dynamics. 
and so they're getting into a lot of um, a lot of topics about where emotions and thoughts and feelings patterns and things come from and so that would be another thing to listen to if you want to really increase your tolerance of being in contact with strong emotions and so that's called Dear Therapist and it's just had the first season and they've, they've renewed for a second season but there's like a few, um, there's, I think there's like eight episodes or something out already and it's not an easy listen, like it's not a light listen, like even when I, I found when I listened to it, like it stirred up quite a lot, so that um, might be a sort of way of getting giving yourself some sort of exposure therapy to strong emotions. Another thing to do, you know, in terms of working out what these mechanisms are, would be to maybe do an experiment of trying, of doing doing these these things regularly, like maybe for a week, every day, she, you know, the first thing she does in the day is deal with one of these um, not urgent but emotionally charged tasks, and then does some pro does some processing about all the all, all of what that brought up, like all of what were what were all the thoughts and feelings that she, that she encountered, and what that reminded her of, like often uh, a feeling that we encounter in a new situation will remind us of a feeling that we had as kids or as teenagers or young adults or whatever it may be. So doing that might help her understand where the, where the thoughts and feelings are coming from um, and uh, however she thinks about it, like whatever when she does these things and then reflects on the thoughts and feelings that come up in the process of doing it, then she can look at how she thinks about it and, and think about where she learned to think about it that way, like where where that learning came from. And those are all ways to get at the, at, get at the mechanisms of what's going on. So that would be what I would do. And the one the one thing I've been finding really useful lately, so there's a, uh, a, there's a long history in the, the literature of people recommending expressive writing for dealing with um, emotional topics. So for people with like post-traumatic stress, like the people, the recommendation, one of the recommendations is to write for like 20 minutes for like five days in a row about the traumatic experience and your thoughts and feelings. Now getting people to write is um, is a bit of a barrier, like that's something that a lot of people don't do a lot of. And one sort of more modern take on that is to try to actually make videos of yourself, talking yourself through it. Uh, and I, that's something I've been using in the last uh, uh, week and a half, I guess, to talk my throat self through this, this sort of grief and loss experience that I've been having. And it's been really helpful like it's sort of grief and loss plus rumination about like what I should do next and um, what I might have done differently and all of that and so that would that would be what I would suggest is maybe um, spending a week doing one of these things like first thing is the first thing she does it for the day so that there's not like a big build up to it and then taking some time, so sort of scheduling in some time after doing that, like maybe 30 minutes or something like that, to um, to talk yourself through all of the thoughts and feelings that came up and try to figure out where those came, where those thoughts and feelings came from and what they remind her of and where she got the message that she should interpret the situation however she is. So... If the situation is she's thinking, I'm not giving this person's needs more and I'm not giving it to them, I'm not giving them enough, then where did she get that idea? Where did that idea come from? And it could have come from family, it could have come from uh, like the broader sort of social pressure, like the broader social pressure that's on like women generally or whatever. Uh, it could have come from um, specifically like training within a particular career, like um, if the message is you should always, uh, you know, give absolutely everything and that's the, the mess or that you should always be 
super careful about avoiding mistakes. Like all career paths kind of have a, a, um, a dominant way people are taught to think about things. And some of like guilt, for example, might come from that. So if, for example, if you're already someone that is fearful of making mistakes and is careful and cautious, as my four year old is waving to me, then it might be kind of overkill if that's super emphasized in your training. Um, so yeah, all of those things, that would, that would be um, what I would do. Uh, and sort of your question, do you have any insights into why managing work-related stress becomes harder when a task spills over into the personal sphere? Well, I think, I think that's because um, Yvonne's already answered her own question here. She said she's got a bit of an avoidant style. So she's, she's somewhat avoidant of strong emotions uh, and that, the, that if tasks uh, involve encountering her own or other people's strong emotions, then it makes sense that she will avoid those my four years blowing kisses at me from the other room wants to know what's going on okay so that is the end of that answer all right thank you Yvonne for sending that in all right so this is from Sh this next one is from Cheryl and Cheryl says sometimes I I get stressed for no reason like I'll be fine then all of a sudden I get stressed out what can I do about it so I think I know that um I think I know that feeling uh, I think I'm aware of when that happens if it's a similar feeling to the one I get from time to time then uh, hopefully this answer will be on track if it is if it's not then um, then maybe Cheryl needs to write to me again and clarify that it's that's a bit different from that but let's so sometimes there is uh, like there'll be like I'll have a to-do list and it will seem manageable you know like I'm working I, it, will, it will seem like there's enough time to do all the things on the list like things are there's a slot slot for everything and then sometimes it will seem like something that needs to be handled all of a sudden it feels more urgent or uh, it feels like there's more there's more incoming tasks than outgoing tasks or so I I get that, that there can all of a sudden something uh, can trip you and make you feel like you're, make you feel overwhelmed when you didn't necessarily over, feel overwhelmed before. Uh, like maybe it's something that felt manageable and then all of a sudden you lose confidence with it. So um, like fluctuating self-esteem is actually more common than low self-esteem. Low self-esteem, true low self-esteem where people feel this deep sense of unworthiness uh, is, is rare and fluctuating self-esteem is much more common so you know sometimes it can feel like the wind will you know change direction and I'll go from feeling confident about something to feeling unconfident about it uh, and one of the things I would try for that is inventing a character for that feeling that so you want to externalize it somehow a little bit so invent a character for that sense that comes over you where, where you suddenly get stressed out, right? So that you have on one hand that you're, that you're, my four-year-old is like still talking to me. Uh, on, one, yeah, you, on one hand you have this, you know, I got this, I'm a competent adult, like I'm confident with, you know, my roles, whether it's work or parenting or other aspects of adulting and then you have this this imagine a quirky character so I always imagine like a little gremlin a little I always think of like a little potato chip eating gremlin that like with always that whatever it does it like carries a bag of potato chips around with it and it stuffs them in its mouth constantly and it's really messy so it has this like gremlin fur and it's covered in like old potato chips and this gremlin comes along and says you know actually no you know actually you know that you, you might think you're doing all right at life but you're not or you might think that you've got time to do all these things but you don't or you might think that you have the skills to handle whatever but you don't and so if you imagine that coming along um, and it that will help you get the thoughts out right so that it's not as um, that it doesn't feel so out of the blue. Like there will be, 
sometimes when you're not when, when it seems like there's not thoughts that accompany something sometimes when it's just like this change in emotions that comes out of the blue you've got to work backwards and think well if i'm having this change of emotions then what thoughts does it make sense might be underlying that like if all of a sudden i feel really unconfident when i felt confident before well what are the thoughts likely to be underlying that and it could be thoughts about needing to do something perfectly or being uh you know rejected or the this catastrophe going to happen if you don't do something perfectly it could be could be anything but you can um you can kind of work backwards and from from the feeling and guess what the thoughts underlying that might be even if they're like in a literal sense there aren't thoughts going through your mind right at that moment that's what you can try so that would be what i would do for that one and then last one for today is this is from nita nita um i hope i'm saying that right so she said i've moved from a situation of racing mind and frozen body in stressful situations to a quieter mind and belief that i can do it whatever it might be okay so she's saying she's made some progress right she's handling stress better she's got this confidence that she didn't have before and a quieter mind but a voice in my head keeps insisting i'm probably underreacting. i'm avoiding thinking about something if i'm not stressed now i will pay for it later i want to know how to balance good stress and bad stress and what's the difference okay so yeah so when it comes to worry uh, and people that are uh, have a sort of propensity to worry and a propensity to do a lot of rumination about things so this is people have conflicting meta metacognitions right so a metacognition is your thinking about your thinking so people who are who are um, prone to to a lot of worry tend to have both positive and negative beliefs about worry. So they believe on one hand that worry helps them avo um, avoid disasters. They might believe that worrying helps them get to some good solutions or it helps remind them to be cautious or it helps um, it helps them, you know, if they worry, then they're always gonna have a plan B and a plan C and that that's helpful sometimes. And then on the other hand, they have fears about the worry, that worry might make them sick somehow i'm doing totally a mike pence fly problem here like not actually on me but there is a fly gross um so yeah so okay so um she's what she's saying is she's got to this point where she has some confidence but she's but she's got this other message coming in there that says that confidence is is false basically that you shouldn't have this confidence you're probably underreacting you're probably avoiding thinking about something and that if you you know she's not doing that worrying now she's going to pay for it later so one of the thoughts that i come back to in um in that sort of a scenario is thinking about all that and this is this is can be a bit of a scary thought for high for people that are high worriers but coming back to all the times that i have worried about a hundred different things and the thing that has actually gone wrong has not been in even in that hundred things like it's been something totally out of out of it wasn't on the list of things that i was worrying about i was worrying about a million other potential scenarios and not that scenario and like i can i can clearly even remember a time in the last like couple of weeks where that has, has happened and if you can think of some some if you can kind of collect scenarios in which that occurs in which you worry yourself to you know like you worry yourself ragged right trying to trying to think through every way something could go so that you then also think of a way that you could handle it if it did went that way it did go that way then and then something completely that you didn't even think of happens it can help you realize that you that a lot that a lot of times thinking endlessly doesn't result in you being more equipped to handle something that goes wrong when it goes wrong right because often it just wasn't it wasn't the thing the situation ends up being different so i think having specific examples that you can think back to where that has happened can be useful and it's a it's a, it is a bit of a like it is a sort of a radical 
and and a wee bit anxiety provoking way to think because you're you're thinking oh well, this thing that I saw as my crutch this thing this this way that I saw is is you know I can prevent disasters if I'm prepared to worry and stress endlessly if you think well that doesn't really always work then then you're sort of with a bit of free fall right but there's something about that free fall that can be freeing uh, and the other thing I would do is is to think about how, to really emphasize that your skills at dealing with situations when they happen so look at whether in a really objective way whether you handle things better when you have pre-worried about them when you're pre-worried about that outcome versus when you when something unexpected happens and you have to react to it and a lot of times uh people who fit the kind of profile that 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 Misha seems to 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 have a lot of times these are people that are actually really skilled at dealing things when they dealing with things when they happen so that all the pre-worrying doesn't actually enhance her ability to do that um So, you know, this, this her, when she has this voice in her head that says, I'm probably underreacting, I'm avoiding thinking about something, if, I, if I'm not stressed now, I pay for it later. But you can counter that by recognizing that it's, that it's not that nothing bad is going to happen, right? It's not that there's going to be, that, that life is going to be this, you know, sunshine infused picnic where nothing, where nothing bad happens, but that you're just equally well equipped to deal with the random uh, negative things in life that pop up without having sort of predicted and planned for them in advance. Um, and so there's no, there's not necessarily a cost to the underreacting. Like maybe in some of those scenarios, she is underreacting, right? So maybe that that's true, right? Um, maybe she's not thought about all of the potential things that could go wrong, but there isn't as much danger to that if she recognizes that she would handle them just as well without having pre-thought them all, pre-thought through them all. So yeah, I'm getting totally distracted by this fly now, so I'm gonna leave it there. And um, yeah, and hopefully I did a few things better today than I did in the last video. And I, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that for now and we'll see you in the next one. So please, if you wanna encourage me to do this, if you wanna be supportive, a super easy way to do that is to hit the thumbs up button on the video and to subscribe. So I know a lot of you are already subscribed to my uh, email list, but if you could subscribe in YouTube, that would be super awesome. And if you do that, uh, you'll be more likely to know uh, when I'm doing more of these so that you can get your questions in about other topics. All right, so thank you very much for watching if you got through to this point of it, and I will see you in the next one.